as far as the expectations go, I think one of the tools that we're talking about is mm -hmm. letting go of expectation because mm -hmm. the more expectations you have of things that are just out of your control, you're always going to be disappointed. You know what I mean? So I think one of the things that I really set as an intention, especially during this time and, and the context is like, I don't have any, any expectations for this record. I understand that it's a weird time. I want to put art out because it's what I'm proud of. And I think that it adds a lot to people's lives. But beyond that, like, let it do what it may. I'm going to do everything I need to do, like budget what I want to and put the, you know, my efforts where I want to have the conversations and do the press that I want to. But beyond that, I just have to let the water flow. What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Today, my guest is my good friend, Victoria Canal. She is a 22-year-old artist, singer, and songwriter, and producer now. Based, well, she's kind of based all over the world. She was based in LA, but then when... The shutdown happened, the coronavirus shutdown. She moved to where her parents currently live in Amsterdam, and she's been more or less quarantined there for the last six months. Victoria and I discuss how she's been handling the last six months. This was her breakout year. She had two massive tours scheduled. She had just finished one uh, supporting the band Tall Heights, and then she was leveled up to an even bigger tour with Leslie Odom Jr. supporting him. She just came out with her new EP, and you can imagine that the release strategy changed quite a bit. So we talk about that as well. Also, her manager, Andrew Lieb of Red Light Management, I had on the show uh, a few months back. Check out that episode. You can get kind of the other side of Victoria's career and that trajectory. Now, we recorded this interview shortly before the coronavirus shut down the entire world, but he talks about kind of why he decided to sign Victoria and what it was has been like working with her so far. So you can get that perspective as, as well. Now, Victoria, if you don't know who she is, uh, listen to her music, check out her story. Really interesting, incredible artist. Listen to her new EP. It just came out called Victoria. And I hope you enjoy the interview. As always, please follow this podcast, like, subscribe. However you're listening to this right now, please give us a follow Find me on Instagram and Twitter and find Victoria on Instagram. I am at Ari Herstand or at Ari's Take for all things Ari's Take on the show where we all live. Victoria is just Victoria Canal on all the socials. Visit Ari'sTake.com. Subscribe to the email list. You definitely want to be on that email list if you are not yet get on that list. I send out emails, all the new musings on the music industry. Every time we have a new show tips, tricks, everything I'm learning, all the crazy stuff that's happening in the industry. If you want to keep up with what's going on and how you can run a successful music career, everything that I learn, I pass along to you, but you got to be on the list. So go to aristake.com, pop your email in there, sign up on the email list. All right, let's kick into the show. Where are you? Are you at your parents' place in Amsterdam? I'm in Amsterdam. Yeah, I've been cool. here since, since March. Yes. Since the tour got called off and my dad was like, maybe you should come home. So you so. must have you must have really uh, gotten the flight right under the wire because did, didn't they like shortly thereafter just like shut down all travel between Europe and the US or how did that work? Like when did you hop on that flight? Yeah, it was it was um, like two or three days after I came wow. home. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was so you call this. Close. So this is home to you? You consider this home now? You say until yeah, I came I home. Yeah, I guess so. Wherever my okay. parents are, I consider uh, home. And they're always okay. moving around, but they've been in Amsterdam for four years now. Actually, five years. They just hit the five-year mark, so. Oh, wow. Wow, yeah. I like that. Where my parents are home. Okay, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> because, so have you ever done the count of how many, so how many homes would you say that you've had over the course of your life? I guess, how many different places have your parents lived and you lived? I think it's nine. Okay. I think. But let's see. So there's uh, born in Munich, house in uh -huh. Spain, uh, Shanghai, Tokyo, uh, back in Spain, in a different house, Dubai, back in Spain, different house, um, London, uh, New York. Well, the, the, this is me off on my own. New York, uh -huh. uh, Dallas, and then LA. LA. 
Yeah. yeah. So yeah. in New York, you went to NYU. You're there for a year. Yes. Yeah. Just the year, right? Just the year. Okay. And then I went on. I I got on a tour. So that's right. The uh, oh, it was so I'm. Uh, I'll never forget when we went, it was so sweet when we went back, when we were in New York, when was that? I think this is like this past January, February. And we, we, we were palling we around New York. Together. We went to your dorm. We went to your old dorm at NYU and we said hi to the security guard. Oh my God, that's <laughs> so true. She's the sweetest. Oh yeah. my God. She was so yeah. sweet. I don't think she remembered me though. Did she? She wasn't happy her. that, it seemed like she remembered you, but she didn't, she wasn't thrilled that you dropped out of school. I remember that's when right. you mentioned that she was like, you got to go back to school and I'm like but she just played the Apollo she's like oh <laughs> <laughs> right so, right that yeah, was, was cute fun. yeah um so how has it been in Amsterdam what's it like there right now what's like going on is it reopened is it open or is it still shut down like like the states is yeah it's pretty much open man like everybody respects the distance and then um like on public transport and stuff, there you you have to wear a mask. But other than that, um, everything's normal. You know, you can go get coffee, and I think the cases are rising a little bit, so everybody's mm-hmm. being a little bit um, uh, cautious. But for the most part, people just follow the rules, and and it's uh, and it's been fairly tempered. But it seems like in the states, it's a lot crazier, huh? One of the best parts about LA, obviously, is the community and the people here. And like not able to see the people and not able to go to the music venues and everything shut down. And, you know, we've just started doing like park hangs where we'll all like, you know, hang out in the park and a few of us and we'll have blankets and spaced out and stuff like that. And and that's nice. But uh, I really miss live music. Is there is there live music happening in Amsterdam yet? Has it come back at all? Well, I actually have my first live gig since March or since like before the pandemic yeah. Um, at Soho House, Amsterdam. So I think people are doing like little socially spaced, like I think okay. there are like max 15 people coming to the show. Okay. So it's very, okay. you know, like very spaced. There's ventilation and all this kind of mm-hmm. stuff. But are you live definitely streaming? not like the uh, whole, you know, just walk by a jazz bar and go in to check out the right. scene. You know? Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. How how did it feel? Because you had just gotten off the Tall Heights tour, which was how many dates was that? Uh, 20 or something like a lot and and yeah. i caught your show in minneapolis at first avenue there the the entry when it was great it was so much fun it was like it was there was such energy and it, great to be back in the twin cities during winter and uh even as 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 awful as it is it's still nice to get that brisk air once in a while and just remember <laughs> what that feels like because we never get that here but then like yeah. then you jumped right from that i think they overlapped a little bit to the leslie odom jr tour right yeah, yeah, I was I was basically like two dates in to the Leslie tour. Mm. And oh, one second, hold on, get this. There we go. Um, so yeah, you froze for a sec there. I I just I just changed my my Wi Fi. We'll edit this because I I uh, yeah I was on my other one. No Ethernet um, for you. What's that? No Ethernet cable for you. No, no. The hey, I gotta follow my own <laughs> rules, right? <laughs> no, I my my box is way out there. You you recognize this room, right? We've rearranged a little bit since you've been here last. This is oh, my cool. this is the studio, yeah. But oh, nice. I miss it. I've made yeah. many a demo there. <laughs> That's you've, right. <laughs> you've, you've lent me that room many times. <laughs> yeah, I just connected. I sent Maxwell a night a DM, uh, just cool. like when it because like he added. Uh, he, he worked on, was it Redo Redo and Victoria? and Victoria. Yeah. It's cool. Cause like, I'm going to jump back to the touring thing in a, in a second, but (laughs) now that we're talking about your music, uh, I'm going to just jump around. Um, you know, it's nice because I've heard these songs from demo stage from when you sent them to Andrew before Andrew Lieb, your manager, uh, my great friend, also a guest on the, on the show. So go listen to his episode. Um, but like. I remember when he, when you guys hadn't started working yet, because Andrew, you know, he's very discerning. And when he was looking for a new artist, uh, the music, obviously, uh, you know, is first and foremost, and he has to really connect with the music. And I felt, I felt very, 
uh, important that he was. I was like his confidant in that moment. He was like playing. He's like, "What do you think of these? What do you What do you think of these these songs? This is like this. It's by Victoria. You remember Victoria? And uh, <laughs> and it was. I mean, the demos from hearing them from demo stage, um, where they were. It's like what was so cool is that your demos to me didn't really. I mean. They were incredible demos. They didn't even sound like, I mean, they, to a lot of artists, they could have been released recordings, but they were your demos. And then now hearing them to where they're at now, which it's like, it's, it's been such a cool journey. And to hear that the record is out, first off, congratulations. I haven't talked to you since it's really, it's come out other than a few DMs. It sounds amazing. And it's like, it's so cool. And it's not only are the songs like, bulletproof and just so great and and like there's depth but it's catchy and the production's cool and unique and your voice sounds amazing but it's like it's it's evolved and developed but it never lost the initial magic from those demos because Mm -hmm. like the demos were so strong and i think you know i was concerned about that when going it's like man but demos are so good i don't want the magic to be lost what was it? So what was that process like when you decided, okay, I want to make these, I want to like turn these incredible sounding demos uh, that you, where did you made the demos on your own, right? Like in the bus or something or? Well, so actually Redo was the only one that I made on my own. Otherwise the okay. rest of the record I, I co-devised with a friend of mine, Martin Luke Brown. He was okay. passing through. Um, I, I was doing this artist residency in Fort Worth, Texas, and he was passing ah. through um, on his way to South by Southwest. And he slept mm-hmm. on my couch for like four nights and we just like wrote a ton of songs, um, like just well, literally all day, every day. We were just hanging out cool, and writing cool. songs. It was one and the same. And at the end of it, I was like, man, I know that this is like our first few days of ever having worked together or hung out or anything, but do you want to be my partner on this record and like help me see it through to the end? And he was like, wow. So, (laughs) so, um, yeah, so I guess in terms of like taking, he's already a great producer. I feel pretty confident, increasingly confident in my production skills, but I knew that I wanted the record to sound energetic and like a, Mm. as, as pop, um, flavored as it could without going, you know, farther than like what is natural to me, you know, Mm. but I think between the two of us, we were like, who could we sign on to like give it the last 10% of 10% polish to just make it really go there. Like to, to listen to it and feel like, Hmm, this could be on the radio. And Mm so, um, so we signed on this incredible 20 year old producer by the name of Matt Zara. And, uh, and he listened to the music. He was like, I have all these ideas. And I was like, guys, why don't we go to my uncle's house in Barcelona and just spend like a week there and, and finish the record there. Like, yeah, divi- yeah. you know, just go crazy, go deep, make all the mistakes and mm-hmm. then take back whatever is not needed and keep, you know. So I think it it, um, it was sort of this process where I just started working with with Andrew, really like, mm. uh, yeah, we had just signed on together. And so I was going, sending him the progress and every day we'd work at my uncle's house. We set up shop like a really sort of rudimentary um uh, set up, you know, with the horrible acoustics, but, but Matt has the ear to make any room, cool. you know, uh, yeah. give you the perfect mix. So anyway, so we sent, sent, I went, um, sending Andrew stuff, uh, at the end of each day. And he was like, man, like I missed this from the demo and this and that and the other thing. And it was uh. so helpful because it's so easy when you're in album making mode to have, to like shut out all influence, which you have mm. to do like during the day. You know what I mean? Like you can't, you can't let anybody else's opinion affect your creative instincts. But then at the end of the day, what I like to do is send it to people to receive feedback, to know like, where can I improve? Where can Mm. I shift around? And what did I add that maybe like took away from like what you were saying, the demos magic, which was there. Mm. So um, it was kind of this, this push and pull and sort of trial and error. And by the end of the week, we had finally um, sort of wrapped up the the polished form of these demos and still some of them needed mixing work and an additional attention you know like mm-hmm. redo was an interesting one because I tried I I um, wrote it myself it wasn't a co-write and I had produced it myself the demo 
And so in the end, we tried recording it from scratch. We actually went through like three iterations of the recording before I was just like, guys, I'm, I'm going back to the demo on this one. I'm sorry. Like we, ch- we tried everything. We hired string players. We tr- changed the key. We did all of this stuff. Like I recorded the vocals like six times. And then in the end, I used the demo and the demo vocal. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, wow. Oh, yeah. okay. So it was the demo, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. Yeah. And for that one, yeah, Max just added a couple of things and, and then mm-hmm. helps me sort of polish the chorus. And yeah, so each each song really had its its own journey. But for the most mm-hmm. part, I really loved going on retreat and just kind of mm-hmm. digging in on, on the production side. So. so what what is the process like when you have these demos, especially when you're with the co-writer producer? You said that was uh, that was Martin. Martin. Mm-hmm. And then you team up with a new producer. Had you worked with this this guy before, Matt? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Um, so you, the two of you are now, you know, there's the, the term demoitis where you've been living with these demos for so long and it's sometimes hard to actually create something that sounds even slightly different because it's it it feels off to you because it's just different. What was that process like working with Matt? Was it effortless or was there a little bit of pushback here and there or or how did that flow with you guys to get to that point where you were both comfortable with where the direction of what was happening that's a good question i feel like for the most part um it has a lot to do with like having faith in the person that you choose to collaborate with. And Mm. I, so Martin and Matt had worked together on, on multiple things before. And when Mart Martin gave me like the stamp of approval of, of Matt and was like, I approve of him as, and his choices. I was like, okay, Mm. let's, let's bring him in and do a day just on drama. And so he came in and, and we spent like maybe, you know, a few hours just kind of going through drama and I was like, yeah, I felt like this kick could be switched out for something better. And then I don't really know what needs to happen in the chorus for it to lift, but it needs to lift. Mm -hmm. And so I just, and, and Matt was like, okay, let me like fool around just for, just for giggles. Like, let me try a couple things and it might be horrible. It might be awesome. Like, let's just go with the flow. And I could tell by that first day that whether or not the, the first choices that he made were the right ones, Mm-hmm. Just the, the process and the back and forth was so healthy and so fluid and safe that we immediately had this rapport of like, let's not do that and let's go this direction. And then, you know, so I think it, it really has mostly to do with like whoever I'm in the room with as the artist, I need to feel confident and they need to feel confident with their ideas. And then and then you just kind of craft it from there. I do understand sort of the question about like being attached to the demo, but I think I was so, I was already so excited by where Matt's ear was going like mm. even just um even just when we sat with drama with him mm. and then he started playing it on keys and there were there were no keys on the track at that point just his voicings and just his like he was singing along and stuff I was like man this guy knows what to do you know cool. like I'm not I'm not worried about this cool. let's cool. he's he's in like you're in you know the- the trust factor, it sounds like, is is kind of the big one where you need to like to acknowledge that you're all on the same team, that you're all right. working for the goal together. And and uh, you know, I was listening to Eric Krasno on uh, the Third Story podcast because he just was a guest there too. It's like this whole little wrapped up family that was. And yeah. um, you know, and love, he was. I love <laughs> the Third Story. Yeah. Oh yeah, and you're for. Uh, Right. I, I wrote about your interview there, actually, um, on Ari's take when you gave with Leo, because I loved the interview you did. So everybody go listen to to Victoria's interview on the third story, too, because that was great. Um, but he was talking about um, when, because Eric Krasno as a guitar player first and then evolved into kind of a singer and producer, is it, kind, it takes um, – a bit of uh it, well you have to remove your ego as a producer and that you know th- i think the difference a big difference between an artist in a room and a producer in the room is like the since it, the artist is putting their name on this and it, it is defining them and their next stage whereas producers could be working on 10 different projects simultaneously and it's not a defining moment necessarily in their career, but it is a defining moment in the artist's career. And so 
it's so important for the producer to remove the ego. And he was even talking about how sometimes he's in the room and he'll kind of maneuver a way to get the artist to actually think that they come up with a, came up with an idea <laughs> just so it made them feel like they had more ownership over it, which I understand. Um, but it seems like you, the three of you kind of had this very symbiotic working relationship um, where there just, there even wasn't much ego involved and in that you are kind of all just like true collaborators on it. Yeah, I think, well, the special thing about what, what Kraz, Kraz's intention is there is mm -hmm. that he's so invested in, in the project or the song or the artist that he's willing to go out of his way to make the artist think that it was their idea because he wants that idea to be there. You know, he yep. really wants that. Uh. He really wants what's best for the song. Whereas like, I've done so many sessions with producers who maybe I'd, I've been set up with or something who just don't care. So like you'll go in as an artist and you'll say all these things and then the and then the producer will be so passive that it's like you come out with a song that's that's so hmm. unrefined or like un unartistic because because the producer didn't care enough because he has 20 other projects with bigger names or whatever it might be. Right. So one one of the things that I really appreciate about Martin and about Matt is that they treated it as their as their own. So it is it is kind of an interesting question the one of ego because to a certain extent like yeah, everybody has to leave their ego at the door, but at the mm -hmm. same time, everybody has to really have a piece of themselves in the project to make it work. And that's what I felt like Matt is so soulful and it matters to him so much to get it right. And that's one of the things that hooked me as, as well as with Martin, who used to be an artist. And that's another reason that he's such a great collaborator is because he huh. knows what it's like. And he knows how unsafe an artist can feel, you know, um, or or worried that nobody else in the room cares as much as as I do. Mm. So like, so to have that security of of equal investment is super special and rare. That's a really great point because it is a fine balance between. It's not just about removing the ego because you still want them to be invested and you want them to have a piece of themselves in it and. Yeah. And that is a fine balance. And I'm sure, you know, producer, I'm, it's great that, you know, Matt being 20 uh, was able to kind of toe that line and the three of you. Uh, but I, I think it, right, it kind of went into just the mutual respect that everybody had for one another and and for, for their 100%. talent, all of that. Um, you know, it was interesting because I, uh, listening to Kraz when he was talking about you, uh, and like when, when you went and, and chatted with him, uh, and showed him some of the songs about potentially maybe help, you know, producing, asking him to produce some of your music and he listened to, it, he's like, you know what, you got this, like you do cool shit, like you should produce it or, or at least like, you know, you have those. And, and it was, uh, that's another part of removing the ego, knowing that where he couldn't best serve the project, but it, it got me thinking like you know, you've now started to dive a bit more into production on your own. And I know, are you using Ableton Logic? I'm on Logic. Logic. And so um, do you see kind of in the future potentially producing other artists, producing your own stuff? Like, do you even, are you even thinking about that? Or you're just kind of like, because of the circumstances, just doing what you can in, in the moment? Well, it's funny that you actually talk about that because I've, that's the only thing I've been thinking about since this release is, and, and the only thing I've really been doing is hiding down here and producing music. Cool. So I feel like this whole quarantine has been such, you know, obviously it's, uh, it's, it's difficult in many ways, but, um, but the time has been such a blessing because I just have an infinite amount of hours every day. To, to hone my piano skills, to hone my logic skills. And like, I have a demo to send you, by the way, um, nice. that I'm very <laughs> proud of because it's just like, I, with each song, I'm getting better at, at production. I'm so excited to be able to produce my own records. Definitely 100%. That's, that's the goal is to cool. produce my, my, and mix my own records. Um, and yeah, I'd absolutely love to contribute to other artists. Um, I feel like there are so many genres of music that I would release myself if it made sense, you know, mm -hmm. or like have other alter egos and stuff like that. But I feel sure, like the, sure. the easiest alternative would be to just write and produce for other artists. So that's definitely cool. part of the intention, part of the 
the mission. Do you have a a routine over the last six months on just kind of a daily routine? Yeah, I mean, definitely less disciplined in some moments, but for sure. the most part, I like to have a morning that sets the day right. You know, I'll wake up and um, stretch and do some yoga, and then I'll journal, write down my thoughts. Um, but sometimes I, I find that skipping the journaling will influence songwriting a little bit more. So the days that I want to write, I skip the writing in the morning. Um, uh, you know, I, I have a, maybe a nice walk in the park and then um, I'll read for a little bit, get my, my brain going. So I don't, I'm not really rushing before like noon and then I'll eat and then I'll get to work. Um, and then I'm pretty much, I mean, this week, I've, I haven't kept up the morning routine because I've felt so creative that I've been working from like noon till 5 a.m. basically. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. And it's just like <laughs> cool. turning it out. And when, yeah, when those nice. phases hit, which is probably once every couple months or something, that I'll have like a week straight of just utter productivity. Mm -hmm. I give myself a lot of space to, re to recover afterwards. But yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those funny things where sometimes the routine isn't, isn't for me, what most influences the creativity. Sometimes it's just divine intervention, but it's definitely nice just for my body and spirit to keep those habits going. You know, I have been taking piano lessons. That's been one really? of the coolest. Yeah. From who? Uh, from Taylor Mackle, one of my best okay. friends. Um, he's just amazing. He plays with like Larry Goldings and a bunch of other cool cats. Over Zoom or like just over like Zoom. A Cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, that's well, a great FaceTime. thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sure. And, and like in this time uh, where you're, uh, yeah, advance your education when there's so much extra time on your hands. I'm, I want to, I'm curious about the, uh, your uh, writing phases and you, you talk about like blocks of inspiration or yeah. this, this phase that you're in right now. Um, but you're someone, I know you do a lot of sessions, a lot of co-writes uh, regularly, do you find that you have um, phases where you go through um, bouts of, of large inspiration where it's all pouring out or you feel like you're fairly consistent? Do you ever show up to writing sessions where you feel like you're dry or there's nothing there or how do you overcome that? Tell me about that. A bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely super inconsistent. Like, okay, so inconsistent. But what I can say is, like, definitely doing sessions will keep me more consistent. And that's one of the things about 2020. I don't like Zoom sessions. I, I have to be in a room with someone to write a song. If not, it's just not going to work for me. So it's really pushed me into myself this year. And I've really been writing a lot more songs alone. And and that's a skill that I want to have. You know, I, I want to be able to. Cause I like, I like this, the sort of, this is like my thing and like, you know, I'm sure. doing it. And, mm -hmm. and so I like that part of it, but, but collaboration has always given me a lot of energy and, and it, I feel like it's co-writing is part of my mental health, like maintenance, mm -hmm. you know, so I've had to make up for that this year, but, um, it's Wait, been talk really about that a little bit more co-writing is part of your mental health more so than just sol solitary writing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, the thing is I, uh, I get a lot of solace from being around people. I, I mean, I guess that's the definition of an extrovert, but like, I feel so much better about everything when I feed off of the energy of other people in okay. general. And that's why I loved living in LA was because like, I could be around people as much as I wanted to. And it just so happens that you can do what I do for a living with other people too, you know? So that's <laughs> kind of like, it was like the best of both worlds. Cause I got to hang out and distract myself. But then at the same time, excavate, you know, whatever isn't going on on the inside with other people as well. So, you know, it's just all of these things that I love to do it wrapped up in one, which mm. is why I love collaboration so much. It's like, I don't think people realize that my favorite part of a co-write is not writing the song. It's hanging out with them, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, like I'm this super cuddly, like cuddle puddle person and, <laughs> and, uh, and I just love being around people and, and yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, but definitely I guess pre Corona, I was, I was a lot more consistent with doing sessions, you know, every week or every couple of weeks. Um, but sometimes definitely the inspiration can be pulled out of me when I'm in the right room, but there have been multiple times where, where I'll, I'll be in, in a room with, um, people who I'm co-writing with. And I'm just like, man, I'm not, I can't today. And that was mm -hmm. the, that was the, the case with Eric Krasno. The first time we met, I, 
uh, went to a studio and I was feeling so depressed and, and, uh, I basically just laid and cried on his couch. He talks about it like it was a great day and it was a great day for me because I met him, but, um, oh, wow. but it started out so, so horrible. And we ended up huh. just hanging out and laughing and he made me laugh so much, you know, and then we, we made more music after that. And, um, so I think a lot of times, uh, if I can't write with someone, we'll just have a really deep conversation. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes sometimes the song is just not what's meant to come out of that interaction. And I think that's also what makes the music so magical for me and not just like this homework or this job is because sometimes it's just not to, not meant to be, you know? And when it is meant to be, it, it will come out. It will flow in the exactly the way that it's meant to, but yeah. Um, there have just been a couple of times when maybe I'll end up going on a long walk with someone instead of writing a song or like painting something or doing a photo shoot or like doing some other form of art because the song is not what's needed that day. When you go into a co-write, is there the intention that this song that you're going to work on and, and ideally finish will be considered for your artist project someone else's or it's always about like you're the artist going into the room right yeah yeah i've always okay. i've i've never had success otherwise to be totally honest with you because then mm. it's like what we were talking about being invested like mm. almost ironically and a little bit hypocritically like me coming from the other side as just a writer i'm not as invested i have mm. to be the artist mm. at least right now sure in this sure. phase of my life and how much i'm going through and my age like I feel like I've got to be the artist who's processing mm-hmm. the stuff and who's got to perform it you know yeah. yeah that makes sense and and speaking of performing so as part of this whole process where you start from songwriting solo or co-writing through demoing through production through releasing to then ideally performing these songs um how has it been for you since you know all your tours and shows getting shut down and and canceled um and being somebody who has spent so much time performing and so much time on the road and connecting to others in that live space especially being an extrovert how has it been for you not um not being able to perform uh it's definitely been hard it's been it was hard more towards the couple months like March, April, May, Mm -hmm. because literally like my life was cut off, like in, in the middle of the tour, like we had just done two shows of the Leslie Odom Jr. tour Mm -hmm. and they were sold out and I sold out of all my merch and like, and we had just topped up, like I was doing very well. And, and people, you know, (laughs) people were following me and like, and singing my songs and stuff. And I was like, dude, this is my year, you know? Yeah. And then, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then everything gets shut down and the, and the tour gets canceled. And all of a sudden I'm like, I grab all my stuff off, off the tour bus and that's it. I'm like home in Amsterdam. I'm with my parents and I like no longer have a life. You know, that's what it felt like to me was like, I had a life. I was cool. I was about to put out some music and then all of a sudden I'm living in my parents' basement. I don't have an apartment in LA anymore and, and I'm lame. You know what I mean? But then over the course of like a couple months, I really took the time to be off of my phone and like spend time with my family. And I got really, my best friend lives here and she's like a spiritual coach and Zen master. And she, um, she really like t- took me on a journey deep into myself, you know, and, and ever since then, I feel like I've had some, some major tools that I actually needed. And I'm grateful for having the opportunity to learn them this year. It's like relying on myself for that self sense of self-worth, you know, like I was, I was so addicted to having people approve of me night after night. And like, um, just being, being rewarded in like my ego was being rewarded all the time, you know? And, um, I don't think that's ever really as, as sustainable, sustainable as people think it is. So I found a way to release the addiction, I think, to like, to that applause, you know what I mean? Mm. If that makes any sense. Um, 
And it's interesting. And yeah. mm-hmm. it's interesting you you call it an addiction. Um, do you feel like now after the initial shock and you've settled into a new normal that you're healthier mentally? Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. I will I I think I think it's more like I have the tools now to mm. to understand like to keep myself in in check no matter what's going on on the outside like whether or not I'm putting out music or whether or not I'm I'm studying and learning cuz I think as an artist sometimes and I'm I'm still struggling with this to be honest but like either mode that you're in whether it's like album making like hermit mode or touring like press mode it really affects you deeply to come out of either one and into the other. Like, like right now I have my first show on, on Thursday and it's a little gig, you know, it's so intimate, but even just like having been in this hermit mode for the past few months and then putting out music and doing this show and doing all this press and doing this interview, like Mm -hmm. I feel observed in a way that I haven't like in a long time now, like since the beginning of the year. And that can really take a toll. You know what I mean? And and same thing with not being observed anymore when you come (laughs) off a tour. Like, I think it's, and and maybe just being observed is, it doesn't really capture the weight of like what it feels like, but it's, it's just sort of like, um, I think sometimes the inertia, like of, of where your soul is at, it can be really confusing when all the things, all the, all the sudden things just 180 on you. And that's kind mm-hmm. of always the way it is in this, in the lifestyle that we've chosen. There's you know? such extremes. I mean, when you're There's on tour, you're constantly in motion. There isn't, a, even, even constantly. if you're in the van or the bus, it's still, you're, you're rolling and you're moving and you're getting from this place. You're never and you shut gotta, off. Yeah, yeah. It's always going. And and then, but you know, you're then on stage, and then there's tons of people screaming and dancing with you and singing, and you're, you're floating on the energy of the room, and it's just like this beautiful feeling. And and then when you're, but it's like, yeah, the 180. It's the extreme to the other end, where now you're like <laughs> you're alone in your apartment, and you have nothing to do. Yeah, you know, yeah, for months I on s- end. <laughs> and I, I think you know a lot of artists kind of uh, when they get off the road. Uh, I mean, artists speak to this often um, because of the extreme shift. Uh, a lot of artists fall into a depression and, and, it, and, and it's something that it, I like that you call it, you're, you're gaining these tools mm-hmm. because if artists don't have the tools um, to help themselves cope with the extremes, because this lifestyle, it's an extreme lifestyle. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, just having to, you know, like yank open your heart and throw that into a song with potentially somebody sitting right there who you met 20 minutes prior. And like, that's yeah. something that's, uh, that's an extreme on, on an emotional, uh, vulnerable side. And then not to mention just like the, the physical nature of everything of, of, you know, being just constantly in motion and on stage and then back in, in a confined space. Mm -hmm. But if art, if I think if artists don't gain those tools and don't, um, lay this, this solid foundation of understanding themselves and, um, and, and, and knowing and not allowing themselves to be defined by the moment and Mm -hmm. to be yanked into whatever moment they're in, but being centered with themselves and understanding themselves and and having those tools to whatever situation they're in, being able to just like center themselves and know that I am right here and I am present in this moment. And and being present is a big part of that. Um, because of the extremes, I like how you mentioned, it's like, you know, it's where your soul is grinding. It's almost like when you're on tour, it's like you're constantly trying to play catch up. It's like, you're, (laughs) you're in front of your body. It's like, it's like, oh, I got to get over here. But then almost when you're songwriting, it's like, you're kind of yanking your soul to kind of play catch up with where you want to be right there. And, but if you can just kind of take both sides and just like center yourself and then be present, that's, I think that that's the practice. And, and, that's this is a yeah that's the practice mm-hmm. but so how 
changing gears a little bit, um, you just released this album, this EP. Um, what is it where normally it would be followed by a tour? You might have still been on a tour, or joining another tour or something. It's such <laughs> an interesting time. And and a lot of artists have asked me, and, and you know, should we be releasing music now? Should we be waiting? Uh, what has it been like to release a body of work when things are so drastically different, when there's no real blueprint of how this thing goes? Uh, are there expectations that you have around this? Are there like, what, what is that? What does that felt like? Mm. Mm. Well, as far as the expectations go, I think one of the tools that we're talking about is mm -hmm. letting go of expectation because mm. the more expectations you have of things that are just out of your control, you're always going to be disappointed. You know what I mean? So I think one of the things that I really set as an intention, especially during this time and, and the context is like, I don't have any, any expectations for this record. I understand that it's a weird time. I want to put art out because it's what I'm proud of. And I think that it adds a lot to people's lives. But beyond that, like, let it do what it may. I'm going to do everything I need to do, like budget what I want to and put the, you know, my efforts where I want to have the conversations and do the press that I want to. But beyond that, I just have to let the water flow, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and know in my heart that I'm really proud of the music, you know what I mean? So, um, but it's definitely been like a bizarre experience because um, everything's online right now. Like everybody's yeah. living their life online. Uh, uh, and I, th I think to a certain extent, everybody was doing that before, but it's just like COVID has totally augmented that, you know, and I feel like I spend most of my time online. So um, I, uh, I've noticed, you know, it's interesting how, removed you feel from the music that you put out like Kras said this in in the podcast that we did he was like it's it's a thrill to like show your friend your demo or your new mix in the car yeah. but it's yeah, not as yeah. much of a thrill to like get your stuff distributed on Spotify because you you don't sit in the room while those people are listening to your song so you, you're not really like sitting there nervous and you don't know who's listening when, you know, it's really hard to imagine. And I've, I've talked to artists like, you know, my friend Alessia Cara, who's like this amazing pop star. She, sure. she doesn't have any idea like what it's the same for her as it would be for me or for like Lucy Clearwater or any other mm -hmm. like indie artist who's putting out stuff like you just don't know, you know, numbers so, mean nothing emotionally. And right. that's, I think what people forget who don't have uh, big numbers, they're like, well, if I could just get the to the million, I would, you know, right. I'd feel better about it all. But then like Alessia Carr, you know, she's probably like, if I could just hit a billion on, on each song, it's just like, you're constantly going to be reaching. But the numbers, the, the, like seeing those numbers tick up, no matter what the number is, whether it's a hundred thousand, a million, a billion, they're not as impactful as even just sitting in the car with your friend playing them the new demo. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just saw this TED talk uh, with Joseph Gordon-Levitt and he was saying something really that struck me was, which was like, um, with the age of social media and everything, we're all striving to get attention all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're always looking at our follower count and like the likes and all this stuff. And he says that like one of the, one of the keys to his own happiness has been shifting his attention from getting attention to paying attention. And it's like, if you can be authentic to yourself and put out the art and let go of expectations of, of getting attention and you can just move on, you let go and then you keep paying attention and let that influence what you make, then that, that makes for a much healthier mind, you know, mm -hmm. much healthier life. And so I, you know, to be totally honest mm -hmm. with you, I feel like I'm not thinking about the EP at all anymore <laughs> like it's out i made it you yeah. know it's a thing of the the past for me and it's now a thing of people of other people's present but like i've been making new songs like i'm yeah. i'm already like five steps ahead you know what i mean and i think that's always the case for anybody who puts out music you always kind of are like oh well now that's like a you know a few it's months old. behind yeah. so yeah. like i have new shit to say and yeah. and i'm gonna say it you know so it's like i and it's interesting i always feel like 
there are things you would change about the stuff that you, you put out in retrospect. <laughs> um, <laughs> and <laughs> check out Ari's song retrospect. I'm in his video. Um, yeah. and, uh, and yeah, like looking back, you would change things. And I feel like every piece of art that you make is to like redeem what you previously put out. And that's not to say that I'm not super proud of the record. I think it's perfect actually. Like I'm really proud of it, but at the same time, like now that I've put out a really energetic, like quite a pop record, I'm going to be making something that's ethereal and intimate and self-produced cool. and like less, less predictable. You know what I mean? Cool. So like, cool. it, yeah. So I, I think it's just always a matter of like looking at the next thing, if, if that well, makes sense. Absolutely. And I love that it's, it's, you're not being too precious with the release and, and I, and that you didn't have these expectations because I, I feel like we never hit our expectations. If there are expectations, I mean, expectations are very different from goals. You can set goals and work to achieve them, but the expectations, uh, you know, I think they can, it, it gets convoluted with the two, but they're very different. Um, well, expectations are external and goals are exter- are, are internally driven. Mm, goals are what mm. you can oh, learn yeah. and what, you know, what you can work towards. And then yes. expectations are, it's just out of your control, you know? So like, yes, why, yes. why dwell on something you just can't control? I don't yeah. know any yeah. artist who really has done better now unless they've blown up on TikTok, but like <laughs> right. for the most part, which is amazing. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I wish I knew how to do TikTok well, but, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm too old. Uh, but <laughs> you're but, too um, old at 22. Oh yeah, my no, God. I, I have no really. hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, like logging on. I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know if I spent more than five minutes on the platform ever. I've like so gone funny. on like, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that I don't know any artists who are releasing through labels or even indie who are doing better right now than they were pre-corona so it's like how are mm-hmm. how am I going to expect that of myself if like not even my favorite artists are getting as many streams yeah. or as much luck as they were pre-quarantine it's just everything's changing so right and it's nice to put that all in perspective um and 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 allow and even for the artists listening to this to allow yourself uh the the room for uh exploration outside of the rat race uh and it, it's i think given a lot of people time to slow down like you've been slowing down and look inward and gain more tools and all of that uh it, it's interesting because i've been listening to a lot of artists on various podcasts and and give interviews and it, it's funny how many of them were saying like this is my year this is going to yeah. be my biggest tour ever and like you know um, and so many artists, I look at like that and, and it, it, that's what they felt like. And then it all came to just a startling halt. Mm-hmm. And it, it's like putting that in perspective, it's just like, it's not just you, it's everyone. And everyone is disappointed with this and figuring it out and not being so hard on ourselves to try to, uh, quote unquote, succeed whatever that really means during this time period, because things are so challenging and, and, yeah. and difficult, but totally. Mm. Yeah. And I think, uh, well, um, apart from the releasing music, I, I think it's also given a lot of artists the confidence to go into sort of an incubation period, you know? So mm. like, even if you're putting out what you made pre Corona, which is what I did, like, I feel like I'm spending this whole year to find a new, angle, you know, and to just like hone my skills and the things that I enjoy, like production, like piano and like vocal arranging and stuff like that. So, so, um, yeah, there's this, there's this good, uh, Maggie Rogers interview where she's like, everybody's focused on like quantity, but like nobody's, uh, she says it in a really beautiful way. I can't remember, but, um, exactly how she put it, but she was like essentially talking about how people are releasing music all the time now and and everybody feels this pressure to constantly be producing whereas mm-hmm. like in the olden times you know 60s 70s <laughs> 80s in the olden times right. like people had you know decades of incubation periods like artists right. visual artists like you know Joni and and Carol King and you know like you had years mm-hmm. um to to craft the next thing and so like when when 
we we're living in a time when you have to really well or you don't have to but a lot of people are releasing songs singles every two three four weeks you know and mm -hmm. um so i think this year has been special in the fact that like people have been able to um incubate a mm. bit creatively you know have you felt the pressure um just because of the era we're living in with this this streaming era and, and needing to put out uh music more frequently do you find that uh it's changed how you write and create knowing that you need like well theoretically need to put out music more frequently or do you just put out different kinds of content and kind of satiate the audience that way uh with your instagram videos or little things like that and and are still taking your time with your bodies of work and your releases i think that's kind of been my loophole honestly is the is the auxiliary sort of content like um little clips of a song or like i'm i'm you know i i have been very precious about releasing stuff onto streaming platforms mostly out mm -hmm. of you know to be honest, in the past, like an anxiety of how it will go, which is like mm -hmm. the expectations that we're talking about. I've definitely, yep. I'm still letting go of those. You know what I mean? It's like everything I'm saying is, is quite aspirational. Um, right. but, uh, <laughs> you know, like I, I, I feel, uh, connecting with people who like me for who I am and, and who follow me for the, for my voice and my ideas and my sense of humor, like that's, that's part of the job, isn't it? And so I feel like while I'm sort of figuring out this part of like the music and the songs and the artistry, I get to just um, maintain that, that um, and continue that relationship. But my relationship with my fans or followers, whatever you want to call it, like that, that really matters to me. And that's, what's making me able to do this, you know? So mm. like being super intentional about responding to the messages and like, doing the ads and like, you know, using hashtags and looking at it from more of a like, um, businessy, uh, perspective, mm -hmm. uh, like your book, you know, which mm -hmm. I've read and I follow a lot of those tips and, um, uh, I, I forgot what your initial question was. I, I, I kind of went on a tangent. No, oh yeah. Like releasing, releasing music. Releasing, yeah. Preciously. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I definitely think that, um, that just being in, in touch with fans, it, like they, they'll be happy to, like, I just did this thing on Instagram where I sent, uh, I, I said, uh, I've got a new demo, you know, a DM me your email if you want to hear it. And I got like 250 emails and I just, Oh like, my God. Sent I love them that. A demo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? That's fantastic. Yeah. So like, I, I wasn't like super precious about posting it. I just thought like maybe some people would be, would, their day could like be a little bit better, you know, if, mm -hmm. if I shared this with them. So it's I think they're just alternative personal. ways. Yeah. But I, I love that because you say that, that you are, um, your you call it your relationship with your audience mm -hmm. is so important to you and keeping everything afloat. And, and I think so many of us lose track of that concept that it, it really is a relationship Right. Uh, between the artist and the fan or just between, you know, humans and artists and, and just because when we we're so uh, concerned with the numbers and getting right. on playlists or whatever, all this but stuff out of people. our control. Yeah. But these are real people. These are real <laughs> human beings. And it's like it's yeah. so important to just remember that. And I and I love that it it wasn't a whole like marketing lead magnet of of go to this website and and put in your thing here and you'll get this new incentive for signing up on the list, blah, 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 blah. It was that like could be smarter, but you know, yeah. This is no, but it, but it was like DM me your thing. Honestly, I would wage uh, a bet that if you went the lead magnet, follow this link in my bio and put your email in, you'll get a, a new demo. You would have gotten fewer people to do that than just DM me your email and you're going to yeah. get a new demo because it's more personal and they, they're showing that you're, you know, you're showing up for them. And so they're going to show up for you. And exactly. it's that relationship. It's that trust. Right. And, and mm -hmm. I think, well, the thing is, is like they, I know, you know, I feel this, deep inside that they have added, they give me so much. And so I have to work hard to 
to give them the same amount back. You know what I mean? Mm. Like I, I can't just sit here twiddling my thumbs. Like it's part of my responsibility to add their to their life because the fact is, is that they are making my life. Like they are responsible for my, my being alive. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I don't take that lightly, you know, I don't also want to make it sound like life or death, but like, I'm, it's like a deep gratitude for, for that support. And I, and I just, I, I, it matters a lot to me to make them feel, um, acknowledged and make them feel, very uh involved and i just find that that's it's a lot more fun that way you know i yeah, i'm yeah. i was telling alessia i'm like the least mysterious person in the world like I, <laughs> I i can't fake it and andrew has wanted me to fake it before and like i'm never gonna be good at that you know like i have to come across as who i am which is like approachable i'm warm i like cuddles and hugs and like i will have a conversation with you because you're a person and i like people you know what yeah. i mean and and so yeah. And I just think that I, I'd like to always reflect that as much as possible through social media, whether or not I'm consistently releasing music or just sharing snippets and staying true to my art. But I feel like I can go at whatever, whatever pace seems right to me because I'm always going to be in touch, you know? Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, Victoria Canal, thank you so much for being a part of this. I have one final question that I that I <laughs> ask. Quick. We could talk. We could talk for the next five hours. But uh, I I have one final question that I ask everybody, and we were kind of alluding to it, and I think this is a perfect segue right into that because, um, I, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? Hmm. Hmm. To me. Making it means being able to um, support my team as much as they've supported me to get where I am, to be able to give them a good life. And like my band and my crew and my, my management and everybody who's ever believed in me enough to to lock arms with me through the journey, I want, I want to give them a, a good life life that's making it to me i love that oh that's so sweet <laughs> victoria it was so wonderful to catch up with you have a great show this week and uh send me that demo yeah <laughs> <laughs>